Hi folks, Chris from Mammoth Interactive here. Welcome to our Intro to HTML course. Really excited to have you on board with us where we're going to take our first steps into exploring what exactly HTML is and what it looks like. In this section I'm going to be writing out some notes as I'm talking and we're just going to kind of explore some of these basics here. So first of all, let's jump right in. What exactly is HTML? In case you're wondering what it stands for, it stands for Hypertext Markup Language. I know, not a super descriptive description. Uh, what's markup? What does it mean to be a markup language? And for now, we'll just understand that this is the standard markup language used to create web pages. And an important point to make is that pretty much any web page you have, you, you see out there, um, it has HTML to represent sort of the, the skeleton of the page. You can kind of think of it as a skeleton. Um, so it's kind of the foundation upon which, say, the styling and the user act interactivity is made. You can't have either of those things without HTML. In other words, HTML basically tells your browser how to display web pages. So browser being something like Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, uh, Safari, Internet Explorer, or Edge. There's all kinds of different browsers out there. And they all share the same fact that they take HTML, they figure out what do these HTML tags, what are all these elements in here, what, what does this uh, want me to represent this page as? So essentially it interprets the markup and it represents that in your browser as a web page. Now back to this markup thing, what exactly is a markup language? Um, you just really need to know that it's, it's a language designed for uh, processing the presentation of the text. So you mark up your text with certain uh, things we're going to call tags, uh, and then the browser kind of interprets those tags and changes how it's displaying something. Think of it as, as taking some kind of document, marking it up with a pen. Um, in our case, the browser won't show the pen markings. It'll show, say, if you wanted to highlight a piece, it's going to show that as highlighted, for example. So I think this will make sense once you actually see what HTML looks like. So what does HTML look like? And maybe you've seen it before, maybe not. You might have seen it if, for example, you go to a page and you accidentally right clicked and hit view page source. And you say, oh geez, what's all this stuff? Well, this is for the most part HTML. You know, This is all HTML. Uh, this is styling stuff, that's not HTML. But down here it continues on. This is all HTML. And you can kind of see that it's marked up in certain ways. We have this thing called a div, this thing called an H1, for example. Um, and that's what HTML looks like. So it uses, I'll put an HTML here, HTML uses tags and elements to enclose different parts of the content. So what that's going to look like is say you wanted to represent some text um, and you wanted that text to be you know, a paragraph of its own. What would that look like? Well we would use this thing called a P tag. So here's what a tag looks like. You open it up with this kind of angled bracket. I'll put it on the line below. You put in your tag name. In our case, it's going to be P for paragraph. Um, and then you put whatever text you want in here. So I'm going to put my name is Chris in here. And then important thing to remember, for most of these tags, you do have to put a closing tag. So this text is kind of sandwiched between a closing P tag that looks like this. Notice it looks pretty similar, except there's a slash in front of it. So everything here is contained within this p tag. This entire thing makes an HTML element, which means in our markup, if we did another p tag after this, like so, p, what's your name, for example, and then I remember to close it off. These are two separate elements. So this is one element, this is another element, and because these are in separate paragraph tags, um, they're not going to sit next to each other on the page, so this is one paragraph, and this denotes another paragraph. So once you kind of see it like that, it starts to make sense when we say it's a markup language. We're marking up what kind of looks like regular text, but we're marking it up with these tags to make them into elements. And then the browser will interpret that and represent it in a way that you are used to on a web page. So I'd say once you, once you kind of get the hang of marking up your code in HTML, it does become pretty simple. There is a bit of a learning curve, though. Um, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to paste in uh, just kind of some boilerplate HTML code that you'll see on pretty much any site. So here we go. Let's explore what some of these things are. 
um, before we start writing some more HTML of our own. So you notice that pretty much any page you'll visit, if you do like what I did over here, you can always right click. You can view the source of any page you go to. Here I'm just on example.com. You can always view the source. And you'll notice that every page always has certain elements. For example, every page needs to have this doc type HTML uh, tag. Everyone needs to start with an HTML tag, needs a head, and then it has a bunch of stuff below that in a body, and then it closes those tags off at the end over there. So what we'll do is we'll kind of explore each of these, and I'll add a little comment here afterwards, uh, just with a pound sign, to denote what these things are. So what I'm writing here, it's not markup, just consider these as kind of extra comments after each of these, um, and then we'll write some HTML later on uh, in this kind of style. So what this doc type HTML does is basically it informs the browser that the document type is HTML. This is required because, you know, back in the bad old days of the internet, there were different doc types that you could use. These days, really, you only really see doc type HTML, so you can just think of this as a historical artifact, really. Um, just know that your page needs this in order to render it out as HTML. That's all we really need to know about that, and you'll always notice that the top, this at the top of the page. So, for example, just to bring it up again, you know, we'll see it on this page, uh, doc type HTML. If we go to a different site, for example, here I am on google.ca, I can inspect or view the page source. Um, in this code, it's kind of all compressed, but we don't need to worry about that. I just wanted to bring your attention to this fact that we have doc type HTML up at the very top. Right? And I can kind of zoom in so you can see that a bit better. Doc type HTML up at the top. So it's just something that every page has and is required. Again, just to indicate to the browser to render it out as HTML. Next, we have this HTML piece. Uh, HTML will basically wrap all the content. So wraps all content on the page. Notice, just like with this P tag, our HTML, we open it, we have all of the content of our page, and then we close it. Um, so that's what this HTML tag does. It just kind of wraps everything up in an HTML element. Again, this is just another thing that's required to get it to render out properly on the browser. And again, to bring our attention back to example.com, let's view the page source. Does this open with HTML? Yep, it sure does. It has some stuff, and then it closes at the very bottom. Um, notice that the order is important. So if this were closed off too early, say we open it here, then we close HTML immediately right here, for example, well, our page won't render properly. So it is important if you are kind of nesting your elements like this, and we'll see this plenty when we're doing examples, um, to kind of do the, uh, close them off in reverse order. All right, so for example, we have HTML and then head and then title, uh, head and title. Well, title is closed off right here, head is closed off here, um, and then we have body opening and closing, and then at the very end, we close the HTML. Um, so just wanted to bring your attention to the fact that if you do close your element, make sure you're closing it in the correct place. And believe me, we'll have plenty uh, to say about that later as well. You know, I'm going to move these guys over a little bit more. Uh, so next we have this head element. So notice it opens here and then closes here, and then we have a couple things in there. Um, so this is essentially where you put contents you don't necessarily want to show to your visitors. So you put content here that shouldn't be shown to visitors. Uh, so for example, and I'll just add another comment here, e.g. if you need to link to style sheets, also known as CSS, or link to JavaScript files. And that might not make sense to you right now. We will be exploring that as well. Um, just basically know that you can have a style sheet or a JavaScript file that's a separate file that you load in to your HTML if you link to it correctly in the head of your document. Right? And if we take a look again at example.com, within our head here, we have a whole bunch of stuff going on. So we have this meta character set. We have some other stuff. We have some style tags in here. And then the head is closed off right there. And this character set, notice it has a meta tag here. 
So this will essentially set the character set. So sets the character set to UTF-8. Um, this one is pretty much almost always set to uh, UTF-8, which don't really need to know too much about. You just have to know that it, it includes most characters used in language, so which includes uh, most characters used in pretty much any language as far as I'm aware. So that would be things like uh, Roman letters, uh, Japanese characters, ampersands, all sorts of stuff. So it's just setting the character set for this page. And, you know, again, we can take a look at what they're doing on example.com. They have that set as well to UTF-8. And you'll pretty much almost always see this set to UTF-8 in my experience. The title here, this is something that your visitors would see. And this sets the title uh, on your page, essentially. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, so if we look here, what did they set the title as on their example.com uh, as? And it's in a different order. That's OK, though. So up here, we can see they set the title as example domain. And if you notice, my tab up at the top is called example domain. So this is where the title will show up. And it'll also show up, you know, if I add this to my favorites, it's going to list it as example domain, unless I change it, for example. Uh, so that's how the title is set up uh, in the tab in this case. So that's what that does. That's really one of the few times something in your head will be visible to the visitors uh, on your page. Okay, so title is kind of self-explanatory. Um, and then we close the head after you've done all you need to do in your head. And we start a new element here, body. So we do an opening body tag. And then in here is where you put whatever content you want to be displayed on your website. So, you know, again, we'll take a look at example.com. We'll just ignore this style stuff for now. Take a look at body. Um, it has a couple things inside of it. So you can see it has something called an H1. It has a P for a paragraph. It has this other weird H A href thing. It closes the div, it closes the body, and it closes the HTML. Right? And what does this look like on the actual page? Well, everything in here is being rendered on the page. Um, so there's some styling applied to it, which we don't need to worry about. But there's a header a paragraph, and then a separate paragraph, which if you look at the markup, and if you kind of know what you're looking at, it starts to kind of make sense. So this is what's known as a header tag. So it's an H1. So this is the header that says example domain. OK, that matches to that. We have a paragraph with a bunch of text in it. OK, that looks like that's this text. And then we see it entered a new paragraph. And that new paragraph has some kind of link to IANA.org slash domain slash example. And what does that look like if we take it from the markup and view it in the browser? Well, oh, OK, that's a link. So again, the browser is just interpreting all of this markup and is saying, oh, this is how you want me to display it? OK, here you go. Here's your title. Here's the content you wanted me to show. So in other words, the body here uh, will contain, I'll put my comment over here, contains all the content you want to show visitors. Which means if on my page I wanted to show a paragraph tag just saying, hello, welcome to my page with a smiley face, I could do that. Notice that I put it inside the opening and closing body tags. And then I just need to remember to close my paragraph tag. And usually there's indentation that you can do in HTML to make it easier to kind of parse out to your human eyes. So if I indent this, it's kind of easy to see that. OK, so this is actually, this P is actually a child of the body element. So it's contained within body. That's why these parts are indented there. And again, that's, that's really for human benefit, because uh, the browser will usually ignore white space in your HTML like that. So those are the really, really the basics. That's all we need, really, to get started writing some simple HTML. Um, we need to have some idea of what markup language is. We need to have some concept of elements and tags. And once we have an understanding of that, it makes it easier to kind of start learning how to write some HTML. So now that we have some understanding of the structure of what HTML looks like, let's go ahead and write some HTML of our own. And we're actually going to be using an online code editor. So you don't need to worry about downloading any software. You just go to this website, uh, jsbin.com. Um, I'm going to recommend you make an account and log in, because that way you can save your work and come back to it later. But in any case, when you open up a new JSBin 
uh, file, this is what you'll see. You know, you might see something like this, JavaScript or some CSS tab, but we can get rid of those tabs for now. And really, I just want to focus on the HTML tab and the output. So the output here is, it's, uh, it's pretty neat on JSMIN. It kind of runs on the fly. So anytime you add something to your HTML, you'll see it over in the output. So a really great tool just to kind of get up and get started writing some simple HTML. And you'll notice that there are some tags that we've already identified here. Right, so even if I go create a new new file here, new JS bin, and let me get rid of that here. Um, so you can see that it has the doc type HTML, and it has the opening HTML. It has a head element. It has this UTF-8 thing. Uh, this meta name viewport. Um, if you're curious, you can Google it. Essentially, it just makes it easier to create more mobile-ready code, mobile-responsive code. Don't really need to worry about that right now. But notice there's a title, and you know what, for the first thing we do, why don't we change this title? Notice up here that the title is located up at the top of my uh, tab here, JS bin. Um, I can change that, right? So let's change this to say, my cool site, for example. Okay, so once that updates, it actually updates it on the fly here in JS bin. So now it's updated to say, my cool site. So that's how you can update your title. And other than that, there's nothing showing in our output. Um, so why is that? Well, we don't have anything in the body of our HTML. It's just empty. So it's actually showing exactly what we told it to show, which is nothing here. Um, you can start to type stuff in here and see what happens. So hello, this is a test. Let's see what happens. You can see it just interprets it as text and it puts it up there. Now we didn't use any markup, right? We didn't use any tags. We just put text as is. Uh, pretty uncommon to see this. Usually, for pretty much any element, you want to wrap it in any text. You want to wrap it in some kind of element. Uh, so this would probably go into a paragraph tag, right? So let's try to write our first paragraph tag. We'll open it up, open p, right? and then tip that I always try to recommend is to always close your tags off right away. So I'm going to close it. Because if you forget to close it, it could cause problems down the line. You know, your page won't render how you expect it to ren uh, render. Maybe it won't render at all. You can run into all kinds of weird uh, difficulties if you forget to close off your tags. In any case, let's write our first paragraph element. So let's write in here. Let's see what the output gives us. So we'll say, my name is Chris. OK, cool. So it looks pretty much the same as the text we just had, except now we've wrapped it in these p tags and this has become an element right so this whole thing we call it an element now if we write some more text for example welcome to my site well this is outside the bounds of this p tag right so it just kind of creates a separate paragraph here anything that's not wrapped in this p tag is kind of put on a separate line um, we should also explicitly wrap this in a p tag so i'll do that and i'll close it and there we go. We have two paragraphs here separated out and marked up nicely, and the browser is interpreting it for us. Um, another way you might see elements written out is you might have space in between the elements. For example, let's get rid of this one. And you might see it like this. So you have an opening tag, then you have some text, and then you have a closing tag. And recall when I said that the, uh, the browser, for the most part, just ignores white space in the HTML. So even though there's a bunch of white space here, it just ignores that. So it's common to see it written this way, especially if you have kind of a long uh, sentence here. For example, welcome to my site. Very happy to have you. This is pretty long, right? So if we had this on one line, um, it starts to get a little bit too long. We kind of have to start to scroll over, especially if we start to shrink our window. Now, I am zoomed in a bit, so the text is bigger than it might be on, on your screen. Uh, but you know, this is kind of unpleasant to have to develop with. So we can solve this. We can start to enter new lines like so. Welcome to my site. Very happy to have you. Put this on a separate line. And you can see that it's still formatted in a nice way uh, in the actual final representation. Now, if you did want to put explicit line breaks, hey, that's totally possible. Um, maybe one thing you could do is, well, this is one paragraph. And then this is a separate paragraph, for example. And really, I would encourage you to kind of tinker around, see if you can get it to flow how you want it to flow, keeping in mind that it will ignore white space if it's all within the same 
kind of paragraph tag. And paragraph is just one of many tags out there. And you know you shouldn't expect to have an encyclopedic knowledge of all the tags, um, but you should be familiar with some of the most commonly used ones. P is used all the time because it's an easy way to kind of separate out a paragraph from other portions of your site. Um, another one that's common is a header tag. And that, as you can imagine, starts with an H, and then it takes a number afterwards. So there's actually six different sizes of headers, starting with the biggest one, which is an H1. So you can think of that as, you know, think of it as you probably want to use that once somewhere on your page. It's kind of the big attention-grabbing header. Let's see what that looks like. So we'll open one up, H1, right? and then I'll close it right away so that I don't forget. Notice that my page was going all crazy because I didn't have a closing H1 anywhere. So it's just making it all really big. But I'm going to close my H1. Um, and now I can put whatever text I want in here. So let's say I wanted my big attention grabbing header to say something like HTML is cool, for example. All right, so notice it kind of applies some default styling. It makes it bold and big. So that's the point of an H1. It's kind of descriptive in a way, right? It's, it's sort of semantic in that it describes what it's doing. It's a header size one. Then let's say you wanted some kind of subheader. So you want one that's slightly smaller to kind of sit underneath that H1. How would you do that? Well, that one, it actually goes H2. So this is the second biggest header. And this one, your subheader would be like, if it's a news story, you know, I kind of like to think of it as sort of a newspaper. So this is like your headline. Whoops, this is like your headline. And then you have your uh, lead, right? The, uh, the little summary of your story. So I am learning HTML with a smiley face, right? It's similar in that it's big and it's kind of made more bold, but it is a little bit smaller than the H1. What about the others? Well, there's a couple other ones. Uh, it goes H3 through H6. So if you want to see what those look like, I am size H3 slash H3, right? And it's just going to get progressively smaller. I am size H4. Um, I'd say it's it's a bit more rare to use you know H3 through H6, but they are available. So I am size H6, H5 rather, and finally H6. I am size H6. Right, so they get progressively smaller and smaller. Um, and H6 is actually smaller than kind of the default paragraph, as you can see. Same with H5. H4, just by my naked eye, looks about the same size as this paragraph. But in any case, you can see that they're kind of in descending order. So H1 is the biggest, H6 is the smallest. And I would encourage you to use these where appropriate. So again, if you do have a big, bold headline you need to outline, would probably recommend an H1 for that. If you need kind of a subheader, maybe an H2 or an H3. And again, it is a bit more rare to see H4, H5, or H6, but they are available. So use them if you want. Um, it's just a bit more rare to see them out in the wild. Another thing I'd like to mention is that you can have nested elements. And we've actually seen that already, right? So within the body here, we have a whole bunch of nested elements, but it can go even further than that. So let's say you wanted to put some kind of emphasis somewhere inside your paragraph, right? So here I say, my name is Chris, and I really wanted to emphasize the fact that this is my name. Is there some kind of element or tag that I can use to do so? And yeah, there sure is. So we can use an element called strong. And I'll open it here, and then I didn't close it anywhere. So that's something you need to remember. You need to close this one because if I put another paragraph down here, test paragraph, and close that one, right? this is the kind of side effect that can happen if you forget to close off your tag. So it's applying strong, which as you can see, just kind of makes it bold um, for everything after this until I come in and close my uh, strong. So that's another reason I recommend just kind of always closing them right off the bat. In any case, a little bit of a tangent there. Uh, so you can use these strong tags, and you can see it's it's actually nested inside these, this paragraph element. So opening p tag, closing p tag, we have our text. We have another tag here, opening and closing tag. And we are emphasizing this piece right here by using the strong tag. Again, it's kind of semantic in that it's describing what it's doing. It's strong, it's putting a strong emphasis on this particular word. You can put as many words as you want in here. 
So blah, blah, blah. You can see it's all going to get emphasized. And then we can continue our paragraph after that. Continuation of paragraph. Right, so only this part that's in these strong tags is styled in that way. Right, otherwise, we just continue and then we close off our paragraph over here. Right, so I'll get rid of that actually, and I'll leave continuation of paragraph in there. Um, in addition to strong, you know, there's there's a bunch of other ones we can use. For example, there's one called em for emphasis. As you can see, this kind of has the effect of causing, you know, it to become italicized. And again, it's it's a bit descriptive in terms of what it's doing. It's semantic. It's saying, okay, em that stands for emphasis or emphasize. So I'm really going to emphasize this part right here. And we can expand it out. So if we want to emphasize all the way to over here, we can do that. Right, so all kinds of neat tricks you can do. And again, I just encourage you to kind of tinker around with some of these tags um, to see if you can think up how you want your text to be displayed and then see if you can write it using some HTML markup. Another common element you will see all the time in HTML is lists. So, you know, a lot of the web's content is actually lists. Think about your typical nav bar, for example. Um, just to take this as an example up here, this nav bar. Um, chances are this is probably a list. And then it's just styled using CSS. Um, think about, say, a products page on a store. Every product on there, it's probably an element in a list. So it's really important to have a good understanding of the lists and the different types of lists you can create using HTML. Now, they are usually styled to a pretty high degree by CSS. Maybe some functionality is added via JavaScript, but again, it all kind of comes back to the skeleton of HTML. And at its core, a list is pretty simple. Um, so essentially, it's a list of things. And there's a couple different kinds of lists. You can have an ordered list, in which case order is important and they're numbered, or you can have an unordered list. Uh, so an unordered list would probably be used for something like uh, a list of uh, ingredients for a recipe, for example. Uh, that's a good use case for an unordered list. And then an ordered list where you'd say, okay, step one, do this, step two, do that. You'd probably want to use for, you know, the actual directions of the recipe as a simple example. So, you know what, I'll clear out some of these headers. I'll leave my H1 and my H2. And let's say, instead of this test paragraph, I wanted to put some kind of list in here. And the first one we'll take a look at is an ordered list. Now lists are a little bit more complex than some of these other examples we've seen um, because you have to kind of worry about nesting a little bit. So ordered list uses this syntax, OL. So I'll open my list here and I'm going to put it, uh, the closing tag on a separate line, slash OL. Okay, and then all of my list items will go between this opening tag and this closing tag. And list items, they use the tag name LI. Right, so you notice that there's now a 1 over here. I didn't put a 1 anywhere. It put that in for me because it understands that, oh, this OL, that means you want me to make an ordered list. Right, again, the browser is interpreting our markup here. It's saying, oh, well, well that's, I know that's an ordered list. And then list items, and then you close off the tag here. And then anything you put in here will be listed as a list item. So if we're going with our recipe example, well, this might be the first step in the recipe, right? So let's say uh, add flour. Okay, simple enough. How do we make another list item? Well, as you can imagine, we just do another li, and it automatically puts a two for us there. And remember to close off your tag right away. This one would be obviously step two. Uh, so I don't know, stir in eggs and so on and so forth. So as many list items as you need. So stir in milk, slash li. Okay. And then as long as each of these li elements is sandwiched between an ol element, it's going to be added into the ordered list. And the order does matter, right? So if I add a new element here in between one and two, well, what do you think will happen? Let's find out. Li slash li. And wouldn't you know it, the order matters here. So this is now item number two. We can say, I don't know, beat eggs as part of a recipe. All right, so that's an ordered list. And what about if the order doesn't matter? What does that look like? 
that one, we would use a UL instead of an OL for that. UL stands for unordered list, right? So they're kind of, I don't know if they're opposites, but they're kind of, uh, th that's the difference between the two, right? This is an ordered list, and a UL is an unordered list, slash UL. And again, lists make up a large part of content on the web, and usually they're just kind of styled up with CSS. So UL, again, we just use list items inside the UL. And by default, it has a bullet point just to denote that it's a list item. But this could be, say, our ingredients. Um, so this would be, you know, flour. You need flour for your recipe. L-I. You need eggs. You know, you could be two eggs. Slash L-I. You need uh, one cup milk, for example. And you can tell by based on the use case which you're going to need. Right? Obviously, something like ingredients doesn't matter what order it's in, but something like directions, of course, order does matter. And, you know, just like before, we can kind of nest other elements inside these list items. So, for example, if you wanted to put an emphasis on this flower, you use a strong tag, for example. And so now this is emphasized, but these are not. Same deal here. You could do em2 slash em eggs, two eggs, one cup milk, all kinds of neat stuff you can do. Um, I also want to mention you can add comments into your HTML and comments are really for yourself or other developers looking at your code. Comments are actually ignored by the browser uh, so it's a good way to learn and, and you know whenever I'm learning a new language or uh, new code feature, for example, I leave a lot of comments to myself because I find it very helpful when I'm going back and looking at it, just kind of reinforce that in my mind. And the way a comment works in HTML is you basically create it like this. So you open it with a, you know, an angled bracket and then an exclamation point and then dash dash. Um, and then you type your comment here. And then the way you close it is you do dash dash and then closing angle bracket. Again, so notice that this doesn't show up over in our HTML. This is purely for us, the developer, and any other developers looking at our code. Uh, so this would show up if you were to, you know, inspect the source of this page. But, you know, most visitors are not going to be aware of any comments. So, again, good for just starting out, just learning. Uh, so for this one, you might want to say, you know, this is an unordered list. Whereas up here, this is an ordered list. It's a exclamation point, dash, dash, ordered list, dash, dash. So, you know, I, I would strongly encourage the use of comments. It, it really helps cement the knowledge in your mind. And, you know, if you leave your code and then you come back to it a week or two later, sometimes it's kind of like, oh, what does this do again? I don't remember what this piece of code does. Well, comments really help with that, um, especially for beginners. One thing I wanted to point out with lists is that you can actually nest lists inside other lists. And this might be useful if you're trying to, say, figure out how to make a navigation bar on your page with a drop-down, for example. Um, for example, if you wanted to make something that looks like this up here, and you wanted to be able to click and see some kind of drop-down list items. Uh, so the structure of what that might look like in your HTML is you might have a list, and then you might have a sublist inside of that list. And it, it pays to know how to nest lists inside other lists, because as we've seen before, right, you can nest elements inside other elements. What that looks like is, let's say we wanted to give some more specific directions in our recipe example in terms of beating the eggs. So how to beat the eggs. And we want to do that as a sublist. So I want it to kind of pop down over here and kind of show a couple extra directions before we get into stir in eggs here. So all we need to do is we just need to nest a UL or an OL inside this OL. Um, so essentially, we're just declaring a new element. Let's do it as a UL. Notice what happened right off the bat. So because I haven't closed off this UL, it's just treating this LI and this one as part of this UL. right? And that's why they got all weird, um, which again, just demonstrates the importance of always closing off your tags right away. Right, so now we have a UL. And all I need to do is add list items. So let's do a couple LIs here. We can say whip eggs with 
whip thingy. I don't really know off the top of my head what that thing is called. It's not a spatula, I know that, but you want to whip eggs with a whip thingy as the first direction, and then you want to get lots of air into the eggs, the Li, and then, I don't know, let eggs settle. As you can tell, I'm not much of a baker myself. But anyway, you can see that we have this, uh, this sub list now, and it kind of auto formats it in terms of you know what kind of bullet points it uses because the browser picked up, oh, this is a list that's inside another list, so I'm gonna indent this appropriately. Right, contrast to this bullet point down here, it does look a little bit different. And it just goes to show, if you know how to nest elements inside other elements, you can make some pretty cool stuff. Right, this could just as easily have been an ordered list if we do OL here. Right, it just kind of restarts a new list, that's why it starts at one. And if you want to get crazy, you could even do list inside of a list. As you will, like so. Too many lists. Dash li. Right, so this works um, if you have kind of a complex navigation, for example, you want drop downs on top of drop downs. Uh, but, you know, just starting, you don't want to get too complex with your lists um, because even just looking at the code now, Right, it's kind of hard to understand what's going on because we have an opening UL, then we have another opening UL, closing. It's kind of hard to kind of backtrace, especially if your indentation is slightly off. Right, If this was indented over there, and this was over there, and this was over here, you know, it's, it's kind of really hard to understand exactly what's going on. So it is possible, but you don't want to go overboard with, uh, with your nesting. Right, and as usual, you can always add in a comment if you want to say, some kind of add some kind of indicator for example so you could say inner list right this would be a note to yourself to be like oh this that's what this is for okay and then you could maybe add another comment here end of inner list All right so highly encourage you to use comments it, it really kind of helps parse out your code if it does have a lot of kind of complexity to it as well. Next, we're going to take a look at how to load images in our HTML. So you'll notice I have a couple new tabs up here at the top of my browser. The first one is where I, uh, where I can look to obtain images. I'm going to use an image of a donut. Uh, this is the site pexels.com. A uh, really good resource for, uh, you know, free stock photos. A lot of them are royalty free. You can kind of use them however you like. So um, check it out, pexels.com, it's a good resource. And basically I've grabbed an image here and I've uploaded it to Imager um, because I'm going to be linking directly to the image. Uh, that's why I've uploaded it here to Imager. So what we can do is we're going to learn about the image element. And I'll just put it at the bottom for now. Um, keeping in mind, it is it, it, there is some importance in terms of where you place it in your page because if you want your image to appear uh, before a list or after a list or before something else or after something else generally you want to space out your HTML in a logical way um, because when I put it down here it's going to be at the very bottom if I put it up here it would be at the top right so um, it does matter where you put your image in any case here is how we can load an image so we use an image tag for that IMG an image tag is a little bit different from some of these other tags we've seen because it doesn't actually wrap anything like for example, this li wraps this text, right? Because there's a closing tag and an opening tag. Image doesn't wrap anything. You just give it basically a URL of the image you want it to load. Now this could be a relative file, right? You might have it in your file system, or it could be an absolute URL, which is what I'm going to be loading because this is an external site. It's going to go to http colon slash slash some URL to get this image. So image takes a source, SRC. And this is something we haven't seen before. This is an attribute. So in this element, there's an attribute called source. And attributes look like this. So you, they have basically a keyword and then an equal sign. And then in quotes, you give it the attribute you want to use. So I want to give it a URL here. I want to give it the URL directly to this image so that it goes ahead. It's going to go to this site grab the image and load it up and the HTML markup basically says hey this is an image I want you to load this as an image um, 
And because it's actually not wrapping anything, we can close this image right away um, without a closing image tag. So let's go ahead and let's figure out how to get this URL. Um, the, probably the easiest way is just to kind of go in, uh, in on Imager anyway, go to get share links, grab one of these links here. Um, I usually just grab this bottom right one. And this is how you can get the URL to the image. Note that I don't actually need or I, I can't actually use the closing bracket or the opening pieces. Uh, so I'll show you what I mean by that. If I try to paste that in, like so, uh, it doesn't like this stuff. So it just wants the URL. So I'm going to get rid of that stuff and just have the URL. And if I scroll down, you see that it has gone ahead and grabbed the image for me and it loaded it up. Right? And we didn't do any styling on it, so it's just the original image size that it loads in. And you notice I don't even have a closing tag on my image. Um, it's it's kind of common to see a slash here just to kind of keep the rest of your code consistent. But technically, it's not required because this, again, image is not wrapping another element. You just give it an attribute, which is the source. Right? And if we check this out, we can see it's a URL. Right? It goes to HTTP colon slash slash and then the URL here ending in .jpg. So it understands that this is going to be an image file. It goes ahead and loads up the image. And HTML elements can have multiple attributes as well. Another common attribute you see with images is alt text, which you can denote like this. So I'm just going to add another attribute called alt. And this is basically text that is loaded if your image fails to load, for example. Or if someone is using an assistive device like a screen reader, they can read the alt text to figure out what the image is. So if you do have alt text, it, it's usually worthwhile to give a little small description of what the image is. So you can say, you know, sprinkle donut, for example. And you don't really see it right off the bat, um, but if you were to, say, make a mistake in your URL here or your image fails to load, right, let's take out a letter here and see what happens. Right, you've probably seen this before on the web. This is our alt text. So the text loads up, but the image failed to load. So it's kind of like a just in case type thing. So if the image fails to load, you'll see the alt text. And if someone is using an assistive device and they want to get a description of the image, that's kind of what the alt attribute is for. Now things like images, you can put them in a list as well. So they can be nested as well. Let's take a look at what that would look like. So I've gone ahead and I've grabbed another donut image. Big fan of donuts in case you couldn't tell. And we're going to load this one as well as this one into a list. So let's see. While we're just tinkering around, we'll keep it at the bottom. Uh, let's, so let's put this one in a unordered list. Okay, so we have our UL. I'll close it. And we want to put this inside of a list item. All right, so we don't just want to put this on its own. You know, let's let's see what happens if we try that out. You know, it loads just fine, but it doesn't really have the bullet point. So we want to make sure that it is an actual list item. And we do that by putting it inside li tags. Boom, like so. All right, so now it's, it's, it's a little bit messed up because the image is so big compared to the, you know, the default list item. Um, but it is listed as a list item here in this particular list. So let's add maybe a line of text here to separate. So we'll do a paragraph separation slash p. Okay, and you know what, let's do something like this, just for our own sake, so we can tell what's what. Right, so this is a list item. Let's say we wanted to make a list of donut images. Right, so this one as well will be an li. And we'll load an image source equals, I'll go ahead and grab the URL in a second, but this one, the alt text will be uh, brown donut held in hand. I think that's a pretty good description of what this second image will be. All right, so that's what it's doing. Um, let's get the share links. I'll just grab this one. And we'll put it in the source and strip out this uh, markdown stuff. Get rid of that like so. All right, and now we have one item in our list and another item in our list. And this might not make sense now, but once we see you know, styling with CSS, You'll see it does kind of make logical sense sometimes to group these things together into a list. And in any case, really, I just wanted to show you that you can put other items as list items as well, right? It's all about nesting. So 
opening list item. We have another element nested in there, and then we close it, and it just treats it as if it was any other list item. Right? And now in this list, we can add other items too. So we can add some just plain text, plain text here, for example. And it's just another part of the list, right? So one bullet point, another, and then another. Next, I would like to talk about links. Now, links are a pretty important part of any web page. Um, it's really important to know how to link to other web pages or even other sections of your own web page. So let's take a look at how to do that. And uh, you know what? I'll get rid of these images for now uh, just because they're taking up so much space because they're so big in our uh, little zoomed in window over here. So to do links, you use an A tag. An A, it's kind of similar to image in that you give it a URL to basically link to. Uh, in our case, though, it takes an href. So a href, this is the attribute it takes. And here you can give it an absolute or a relative URL. So if, for example, we wanted to create a link that takes the user to google.com, how would we do that? Well, you you'd have to put in HTTP. Right, we're giving it an absolute path here. So HTTP www.google.com. You don't want to forget the HTTP because if you don't have it, it's not really going to work properly. Um, and then you close the A tag. Now notice nothing actually showed up on the page. And that's because, well, the hint is right here. We have to kind of wrap these A tags around something. So whatever you put in here will essentially become linkified, is how I like to think of it. And this could, you, you could write anything in here. right? So if I write anything, for example, if I take it literally, you see that it turned it into a link here. And as, as I hover over it, maybe it's hard to see, but at the bottom of my browser, you can see it's going to go to google.com. Right? If I right click and open in a new tab, because I don't want to actually navigate away on this current tab, we can see that it took me to google.com and then Google itself redirected me to google.ca. So usually you want to have some kind of descriptive text here inside your A tag. And that's really for a good user experience. Right? Something like click Click here, maybe appropriate, maybe not, given whatever circumstance you're linking in. Um, but usually you want to do something like go to Google. Um, that's pretty descriptive in terms of what the link is going to do. And the user will kind of know right off the bat, OK, I know what this thing is. This is a link because when I hover over it, my mouse changes to a little hand. And I know that this will take me to Google, right? We're linking it. We're sending an href, which, by the way, stands for hypertext reference, um, to google.com. And let's see what happens if I take off the HTTP. Let's see if it works. All right, so we see I'm going to click open link in new tab. And it didn't really know what to do, right? Because it thought it was a relative path. That's why it has this null.js bin stuff in front of it. Um, because we want to usually go to an absolute path. If you're linking to an external site, generally speaking, you always want to have HTTP in front of it. Um, it's the difference between an absolute and a relative path. Right, so said another way, if you're linking to an external site, just always throw the HTTP in front, um, or HTTPS if, if it's uh, that version of the site. Now, for links, I would say it's pretty common to have them in a list, because it's, it's common to see that as part of, say, a navigation list. So you might have a bunch of links listed together. It makes kind of logical sense to put those together, like a lot of other things in lists. Right? It's, it's true that lists are used all over the place. So if you wanted to throw this into a list, well, you can probably imagine how it's going to work. But just to reemphasize, we want to do a UL. Okay, I'll close my UL. And you want to put it as a list item here. So I'm going to open my LI. And what I'll do is I'll just cut and paste this code in. Cut, paste. Right, So we nested these A tags inside these LIs. And inside the A tags themselves, this is where we put the description we want for our link, right? So that's one link, as you can see down there at the very bottom. Uh, we can do another one. And you want to make sure that when you are nesting something like this, that you put it in the correct order. So you don't want to do something like this, ahref equals http colon slash slash www.example.com, and then put a list item here. Uh, and then a closing list item, and then a closing A tag. And then you can put some text in here. Let's see what this looks like. Right, It, it appears to be correct. 
um, but it's not really following the correct format. Uh, usually you want to just linkify whatever's inside the list item. You don't want to list uh, linkify the list item itself. And you can tell because look at the bullet point down here. The bullet point itself has been turned into a link, um, which might go against user expectations, right? Users might not be expecting, okay, when I click here, it's not going to go anywhere, right? You have to click on the exact portion. Whereas down here, because we've turned this entire element into a link, even if you click here, it's going to take you away from the page. So a little weird. Uh, so just make sure that you are nesting in the correct order and also remembering to close off your elements that need to be closed off. Right, so li, and then an opening a tag, and then you close your a tag, and then you close your li. Go to example.com. And definitely make sure you remember to close off your a tag. Um, otherwise, let's see what happens. If I get rid of it, no, I do not want to inspect it that way. Dot com. Right, so what's happening? Well, let's see what happens if we do another li here. Another li slash li and as you might expect basically everything following this is going to become a link until we close the a tag right so you know I'll, I've said this before I'm sure I'll say it a million times but make sure that you are closing off your tags at the correct locations now your links don't have to be just plain text if you want to do a link that is an image for example that's definitely possible so let's go ahead and do that we'll do href Let's send this one to, I don't know, imager.com. And we'll close it. And in here, instead of just plain text, we'll put an image like so. Image source equals something. And the alt text will be, uh, let's see, sprinkly donut. Right. And just to conform to the rest of our tags, I will put the slash here, even though it's not technically required. Now, notice it's showing the alt text, and this is actually a link. So, let's see. Let's uh, let's grab the share links. Grab this one, and we'll put this into the source, like so. Okay, and you can see that this big image is now a link. So you know what, I'll put this on a separate line. So it's kind of easier to parse out for our human brains. So it's a link. If I click on this, it'll take me to Imager. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put this as the, uh, the href as well. Right, so now let me close this, close this tab up here. And right here, I'll right click, open in a new tab. Let's see where it takes us. It takes us right to the image. Right, so we, we linked to it, and the link itself takes us directly to the image. Right, this could take us anywhere. This could take us to Google or wherever you need it. But the point is, we have transformed an image here into a link. So not only does it show the image, but because we wrapped it inside of A tags, it in itself is a link. Pretty cool, right? Another thing you can do with the A element is you can create a mail to. In other words, you've probably seen this before. You can click on a link, and it'll open up your... Uh, mail program so that users can send an email to you or to whatever email you put into the mail to. So what that looks like, and you know what, again, I'm just going to get rid of this image just because it is taking up so much space. So we'll just get rid of that entirely. Um, and I'll just add another link here as part of a list item to this unordered list. So we'll do li and then close it over here. We'll do another a tag here, a href. Um, and before I forget, I'll make sure that I close it in the correct order. And in here, instead of this kind of thing, instead of the HTTP protocol, blah, 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 you want to do mail to colon, and then you put in the email you want this, uh, this email to go to. Right? So if I put, uh, let's see, your name at your site.com, for example, and then you can say email me here, uh, you can see that we have a link here. And whoops, I put email me in the wrong spot. I should have put it right here between the opening and closing A tags. And in here we see, if I scroll down, we see that it says email me. And it's kind of hard to see, but down at the very bottom of my browser, you can see the little preview says mail to your name at your site.com. 
So if you were to click on this, which I can do right now, you can see that it launches my email program. I don't have it set up on this computer, but once it's all set up, etc., cetera, um, you've probably seen this before in the wild, right? So you click on this, it's gonna open up your, uh, your preferred email program, and you can start to fill out the email at that point. So those are the, the most common use cases here for the href attribute, right? So it has either a web address URL you want to go to, it could be an absolute URL or a relative URL. In this case, though, it is a mail to, right? So a little bit different in terms of what it looks like from an HTTP, but pretty easy to do, right? Pretty straightforward. Next, I'd like to get into how to separate the content out in your HTML in a logical way. And we're gonna talk about something called a div element. So a div, as you can probably tell from the name, it's used to kind of divide up your page into logical chunks. And what I'm gonna do is, you know what, I'm actually gonna erase all the code we have here and start from scratch here. Um, and we're gonna build out our, our pieces of code in little sections. And that's how a lot of HTML is written out there in the wild. Uh, so you might have a section, for example, for your header here. This might be one division of your page. Then you might have a section for your main content. Maybe another second for, you know, a sidebar, for example. And then another section for your footer. Um, so these are all ways to break up your page in a logical way. And the basic way to do that is use something called a div. And that looks like this. So you open it, and I'll put this on a separate line, and you close it, slash div. And you can kind of consider it as similar to, say, an opening body tag and then a closing body tag, but this is just kind of a smaller division. And then in this div, if you want to put a paragraph, for example, slash p, and put some example text in here, and then you want to have a separate division Right? because you want to, for some reason, logically divide this out into a separate section. You can do that with another div tag here, div, and then you close it down here. Right? So again, with divs, especially, it's important to close it. You know, I would recommend right away. As soon as you create one, always create a closing tag, and then just kind of start putting stuff in between, because if you don't close your div off correctly, like any other element, it might mess up the formatting of your page. It might not look how you expect it to look. In any case, the browser knows to interpret these divs as separate pieces of your HTML, right? Which means if you start to put another paragraph in here, another paragraph, right? it, it lays it out logically. And then this div always comes after that, right? So I'm the second div slash P, right? And it looks pretty similar, right? It's kind of hard to tell that it's a separate div but it's important to be able to do this and we'll see why once we get into more styling and moving things around with CSS, you know, with your cascading style sheets. So for example, maybe you want a different background color for this div than this div. Maybe you want this div to be laid out differently, right? You want it to be laid out like this, for example, this header up here, instead of just kind of in a block style like it is doing currently. And you might think, well, do I really need it? Well, a lot of times you probably don't absolutely need it, but it makes sense, you know, as a developer to separate your page out logically like this, um, especially if, you know, you expect another developer to come along and be making changes. And it's, it's just kind of makes it more clear exactly what your intent is for this page. You can also have divs inside of divs, right? It's just like any other element. And this just kind of further subdivides your div. So I'm in a sub div, I guess you could call it, right? And again, it's kind of hard to tell because we don't have any special styling on it. So it's kind of hard to tell that it's, you know, a sub div, but again, if we wanted to color this particular div a different color, a different background color, do something different with it, well, now it's gonna be easy to do so because we can just grab it out of this inner div. And, you know, this, this might start to make sense once you kind of piece out your uh, HTML. And again, do you have to use divs? No, absolutely not. But I think it's a good way to organize your code and you'll see it a lot out there um, on the web. So for example, it's common to say, you know, let me add a comment in here. Uh, so this might be, whoops, this might be, for example, your header. Let me do dash dash, close that. And I'll put here start of header. Down here, we can say end of header, dash, dash. Right? And then below that, you can have your start of main content. Start of main content, dash, dash. Right? And then again, dash, dash, 
end of main content. And then you might have another div, right? So div, this one might be your footer, for example. So in here, we can put a paragraph, I'm the footer, slash p, for example. Um, and then you can just add a little comment to yourself, dash dash, end of footer. All right, comments, great way to kind of reinforce this in your mind. You could also just kind of separate it out in terms of adding extra space. Um, right? Remember that the browser will just kind of ignore extra space between tags. And if we kind of break this up further, so up here, it's common to have, you know, in your header, some kind of navigation link. So let's do that. We'll do a UL. And we'll close it. And we know how to do links, right? And we know how to do list items. So we'll do an LI slash LI. This one will do an A element, A href equals HTTP colon slash slash www dot we'll do google again google.com slash a go to google right we can do another one li slash li a href equals http colon slash slash www dot example dot com slash a go to example the main content of your site, maybe you don't have a paragraph, maybe you just want to display an image, for example. Well, how can we do that? We know how to do that as well, right? So we can do image source equals, and I have a couple cake images prepared here. Uh, so let's go ahead and grab this one. Get share links, we'll just grab one of these versions. Image source is the following, and we'll take out this image or stuff. Right? And because it doesn't wrap anything, you can just close it right away. And it's kind of logically separated out now in terms of our code. You can't really tell in the browser, but for us developers, it makes more logical sense now. And then in the footer, you might have a paragraph. You might have, you know, this was created by so-and-so, page created by Chris, for example. Um, and then you could come in and do your styling later. Um, and another thing you can do is, so div is, is kind of a generic name for this. and there are some other tags that we can use instead of div that achieve the exact same purpose. And there are things like, for example, header. So I could have called this header, for example. And header is a built-in element. And all it is is it creates a div, but it's more semantic. In other words, it describes exactly what it's doing. And there were a bunch of these elements introduced in HTML5, which came out a couple years ago. So Whenever you're doing something like this, you know, using a div is just fine. Nothing wrong with that. But, you know, you might want to consider looking up if there's a more semantic version. So for example, this is a header. This is the main content of our site. And wouldn't you know it, there is an element called main. And again, it's just a, another word for div. So it's no different from a div except the name. It treats, it treats it just like as if you were putting a div in. And, you know, it's, it's again, more clear for us developers what exactly we're doing here. And what's this? Well, wouldn't you know it, there's a footer element as well that we could use. And this one should be over one. Ah, never mind. These both should be over, which means this one should be over as well. Right? So there's all kinds of these. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's other ones like article and aside, for example. And you know, just, just Google it, see if there is one. If not, nothing wrong with using a div wherever you need to. Hi, folks. In this video, we're going to be getting into some of the basics of CSS. So I'm going to be writing some notes up here on the page. Uh, and then later, we're going to come back in and style this recipe, recipe site that I made just using some simple HTML. So if you haven't watched it, check out our intro to HTML video. Uh, this is where we have created sort of this simple recipe page. Currently, it's completely unstyled, so it's just plain HTML. We're going to see how we can use CSS to style a page like this. So without further ado, let's jump right in. And first of all, we're going to talk about what exactly is CSS. So what is CSS? Well, it stands for Cascading Style Sheets. Style Sheets. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, you just need to know that it's basically, you think of it as sort of a language. So language to style and lay out web pages, essentially. All right, so if we take another quick look at this simple HTML web page, it doesn't have any styling, right? This is just the default styling that is applied for our HTML, right? Look at this thing like a list. We have a header, we have an image, we have some text down here. 
but it's all styled, you know, it's it's unstyled. So, you know, if you've ever had a page load up before online and it looks kind of like this, uh, chances are, for some reason, the CSS might have failed to load. Um, so CSS is largely used all over the place. Uh, it's a really critical part of making any sort of web page. Right? Otherwise, all web pages out there would look like some variation of this. So this means you can use it to style, can use to style things like the font, color, uh, spacing, layout of page. Uh, you can even do things like uh, animations and even other decorative features. So for example, if you hover over an element, you can do something like make that element bigger or change the color of the font, change the background image. There's all sorts of neat things you can do with CSS. And just to write out another note here, CSS, again, it's a language uh, for figuring out what your document should look like. So language for styling your document and determining how it is presented. Right? And you can think of your document as HTML, for example. That's one type of document you can use CSS with. Right? And HTML is what's known as a markup language. So you mark it all up with HTML and then you style it up using CSS. So how does that work exactly? Well, let's make a new bullet point here. Uh, so how can we alter the appearance of HTML with CSS? Well, basically how it works is when you load up your HTML, the browser does a lot of hard work for us. So not only does it kind of parse out the HTML and present it in a way that makes sense, right? So just as a quick example, we have some HTML here. For example, this, uh, this paragraph. Where is the paragraph? Here, this paragraph, right? So we sandwiched it between P tags and the browser interprets that for us and it gives us the following result, right? It formats it for us. So after it does that, it also looks for any style elements. So do we have an external CSS file or do we have some kind of declaration inside of style tags telling us how to lay out our site? Right, so again, the web browser does a lot of work for us. So the web browser looks for CSS rules is what they're known as. And these rules will kind of grab out pieces of HTML to kind of set properties on them. So you can think of a CSS rule as like this. So let me indent this. What's a CSS rule? Well, it's formed from a couple of things. First of all, there is a selector. And this is essentially, let me just add that in, essentially selects the HTML element or elements you want to style. Right, so there's a selector. So you say, okay, I want to style this particular piece of the page. And then what properties you want to apply to style it. Right, so properties uh, which you want to change. Properties which you want to change. Uh, so again, as a quick example, let's say we have this section here, this entire section. And we want to change it somehow. So if we look on our page, that's uh, the section where we have a bunch of just kind of lore myths, some text. So there's all sorts of things we can do with CSS. One example is let's say we wanted to make the background color different for this entire section. Well, we would use a combination of these two things. So we would say, okay, I want to grab that section using a selector, and I want to set the background color property to a different color, for example. And that is essentially how we can style out our page. So as you can imagine, CSS files can get pretty complex, but they can also be pretty simple, right? You can only grab certain pieces if you only want um, and then style those pieces. And really, it's, it's usually about kind of slowly building out a CSS file. So you kind of uh, change your file as you go, keep an eye on it, see what's changing, see what works, see what doesn't. And you do a lot of that with uh, what are known as CSS declarations. So CSS declarations. And CSS declarations really are where you set the CSS properties to specific values. And really this is, 
you know, this is the main function of the CSS language is doing this. And like any other language, you know, it takes a while to learn the language, but then once you get comfortable with CSS, you can do some pretty cool stuff. So chances are you have seen some kind of nicely designed stylish web page out there and a lot of that would have been accomplished with CSS. So let's take a quick look at what a CSS rule looks like. What's a selector? What do properties look like? And essentially it's going to look something like this. So you, we have different ways of grabbing the elements in CSS that we'll explore later. But if you just want to see a simple example of a CSS rule, it would look something like this. So, you know, you grab some element, some element, and then inside a block, so inside these curly brackets, this is where you set the property you want to change and what you want to change it to. Uh, so, whoops, I misspelled element. So this would be the selector. Um, and like I say, there's different ways of grabbing it. You can grab it via the ID or a different attribute. Um, but in any case, you grab out your element somehow in your CSS. And then the way you can set the property, it's basically property name colon property value. So there's lots and lots of different properties out there. So your best bet just starting off is just to kind of Google it. So if you're trying to do a specific thing with CSS, for example, if you want to change the background color, just Google how to change background color with CSS. Um, a lot of them are pretty straightforward as well. Um, CSS, you can use hyphens. Uh, so for example, I happen to know offhand that background-color background is the way you would change the background color of an element. All right, so notice background dash color, and then you can put in, you know, there's different ways of putting in the color. So you could just key in something like blue. Uh, you can use an RGB value, for example, red, green, blue. Uh, so I'm not sure offhand, but if we wanted to do blue, for example, we could do 00, 255. And right, if, you, if you're not too familiar with RGB values, you can kind of look up online on a color picker. Um, it'll give you different options for how to see the color. Um, RGB is one way. You can also use hex values. So, you know, this usually looks something like F something, 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 a bunch of letters and numbers. Um, and again, you can just kind of Google color pickers and it'll give that to you. But just starting out, you know, I would recommend just kind of using plain solid colors like, you know, teal or red uh, this way. This element's background color, assuming we grabbed it out correctly in our CSS selector, which is this piece. And assuming our property is correct, it's going to apply this property. Now, if you do make a mistake and you know you notice and you don't notice it, it's not going to break anything. It just won't know what to do here. It just won't apply this uh, this property. Right? And in any given element, you don't have to do uh, one change at a time. So let's say you wanted to do a whole bunch of things on some element. So change the background color and also maybe change the font size. And font size as well, I just happen to know, it looks like this. This is the property, font size, colon. And then you can change the font size in different ways as well. So you can use percentages. You can use things like pixels. Uh, so for example, if you wanted your font size to all be 50 pixels, it would look like this. And again, just starting out, I would recommend just kind of tinkering with pixels. Um, this is how you can set, you know, kind of common font size inside this element. Right, so it's not uncommon to see, let me actually redo this, it's not uncommon to see a whole bunch of properties being set at once on some element and that's just part of CSS. That's something you'll be doing uh, quite a lot. So in theory we understand um, how to select an element and you know what some styling looks like and before going in and writing some CSS of our own and actually styling up a page I wanted to take some time to explore this concept of the CSS, CSS box model. So the CSS box model. Um, and you know it, it's really important to have a good understanding of the CSS box model if you want to be able to write some effective CSS. And the way you can think of it is like this. Think about your HTML. And HTML has elements, right? And basically, in your HTML document, each element, you can kind of think of it as a sort of rectangular box. Right? So each element in an HTML document, for example, um, can be thought of as a rectangular box. 
So, you know, as a quick example, here is some HTML that I've written. And we have, for example, this. So inside this element, we have a paragraph element. Right? And let's look at this entire element here. So on the rendered version, my cool site. So that would be this paragraph. And this element, you know, think of it as being a box, right? So sort of a rectangular box. The browser has kind of laid it out, taking care of things like size, uh, things like margin. Uh, maybe there's some kind of padding uh, between the content and the border, for example. And that's another thing that the browser does. It kind of interprets everything as sort of a box for us. And in CSS, uh, basically, each of these rectangular boxes is described using the standard box model, is what it's called. Right, so the standard box model uh, basically describes the space an element takes up. Um, and each box has four edges. Um, so there's basically the margin edge margin, border, padding, and content edges. And so what I'm going to do next is I'm just going to paste in a visual representation of this box model that I've sort of created previously. Um, please excuse my amateur art here. And this is what pretty much every HTML element kind of looks like to the, to the rendering engine, to the browser. So starting from the inside here, this is where your content will show up. So your content in here, you can have an explicit width and height set on it, but this could be, for example, your uh, text inside of a paragraph or your image, for example. So content stuff goes in here. And that's not the end of the story, right? Because we have the CSS box model, we have kind of the greater picture to think about. So not only is there content, but elements are also concerned with padding. Um, and padding basically um, acts as padding. It's kind of in the name. So uh, let's say you have some kind of background color set for your content. Right? So going back to our paragraph example, let's say your paragraph, you wanted to set the background color to red. Well, that would also extend out to the padding. Um, right? So it kind of adds extra space between the content and the next edge. Um, it's kind of useful to think about the padding here as sort of extending the uh, content. And by the way, if, if it's, this is not making sense to you right now, I think it will start to make sense once we write some simple CSS. We'll kind of come back and take a look at this border or this, uh, this box here after we've done so. In any case, so the padding, it sort of acts as an extension of the content in terms of, you know, if you set a background color or some other aspect. You can just kind of increase the padding if you ever need more space between, say, the border and the content. That brings us to the next piece here, the border. right? So there's padding, which would contain all this stuff. And then we have the border, which contains all of this stuff, essentially. And you can kind of think of this as extending the padding area to the edges of the border. And you know, you can use this if you ever want to, for example, set a border around your element. Um, you might be trying to set a border and you would expect it to go around here, but there's some padding you might need to consider. Um, so that's something to be aware of as well. And again, we'll come back and take a look at this once we've kind of written some simple uh, CSS. Then the final part of the box we need to know about is the margin. So think of the margin as sort of being sort of outside the box itself in the fact that this is kind of used to set the space between one element and another. So what I mean by that is let's say you have one element on top and then another element below and you want to add a whole bunch of space in between. Well, what you could do is you could manipulate the margin on the top to add a whole bunch of space. You could manipulate the margin on the bottom of the previous element to do that as well. Same story if you have sort of two elements sitting next to each other on the page. You can set the margin to be greater or less or set the same margin for both elements and that'll affect kind of the, the space in between. So you can kind of think of this as kind of a divider or you know a way to add in a separator. Right? So in other words, it separates this box from its neighbors. 
And this stuff is all pretty important to know when you are working with CSS to manipulate your layout. You know, the, these things are things you need to know because, for example, the default settings are when you're setting the width, you might expect that to set only the content, but it might also be affecting your padding or your margin. Um, so things to be aware of. And one other thing I wanted to show you is you can actually look up what the box kind of looks like in your CSS if you ever want to. Um, so by default, you know, this box model, it's always there, even if you don't explicitly target it or set it with CSS. Um, and what I mean by that is let's, let's do an inspection on this header element, for example. And you can do that quite easily if you're using Chrome. And all you need to do is kind of put your mouse in the area, right click and hit inspect. And what's going to happen is Chrome will pop up a little tab or a window and taking you, taking you into the Chrome dev tools. Right, so I'm going to do that now. And we can see that it opened up this little panel down here. This is what's known as the Chrome Dev Tools. And this is a really useful feature when you're just starting out because you can kind of inspect any page, look at their source code, and kind of see how they did what they did. Right, you'll notice that this looks a lot like the HTML we wrote. Right, so for example, just to go back over here, it's kind of parsing it back out into HTML for us. right? So we can see, OK, that's what this looks like. Then we have a section, blah, blah, blah. Right, so it kind of breaks it out for us, makes it nice with little kind of drop downs. And really, we just need to know that you can do this in Chrome. And the thing I wanted to draw your attention to is this side over here on the right. Um, so this is showing us the CSS or the style that's being applied to this particular element. Right, notice that it's an H1. That's the selector. And then it has a bunch of these kind of default rules set. Right, we don't have any CSS currently on this project. If I go to CSS, there's nothing there. Um, because the browser will automatically apply certain styles um, always. And what I wanted to show you is down here. Right, so this is a representation of the box that this element is a part of. Right, so it's telling us the dimensions. And we can see, OK, so here's our content. And wouldn't you know, this looks pretty similar to this box that I've created over here. Right, so we have our content, and when you hover over it with your mouse, it does kind of show you highlighted on the Chrome page up here. So we have this. It doesn't really have any padding on it. Notice that these values are all set to basically nothing. Border, you know, it doesn't have any value set on it either, but there is a margin. And so if I highlight this, notice that there's all the space between this H1, right? So there's this space here and this space above it. And that's because there's a margin. And just eyeballing it, it looks like it's about 21.440 pixels. It says it right there. Um, and that is a way that this, you know, the default styling applied to H1s, it just doesn't set any padding, doesn't tinker with the border, but it does set a certain margin. And so that's pretty cool. That that's kind of maybe helps cement it in your mind a little bit more. And, you know, as you're kind of exploring the web and if you see a cool layout, I would really encourage you to, you know, if you're using Chrome, right-click, inspect, it's going to show you... Uh, dev tools. Um, there's a similar dev tools in Firefox and Safari. Uh, so, you know, whatever browser you're using, there's probably some pretty good dev tools implemented now. And, you know, we can do that with our image as well. So let's do it with this one. So I'll right click on it, inspect. Okay, we can see that it's selected the image and it's just showing us the dimensions of the image. There's not really any other styling applied. There's no margin, border, or padding. Right, these values are still there, they're just not being set explicitly by the browser. Right, same thing with, say, these list items. Right, so let's take a look. Inspect. Okay, so we are on one list item here. Well, it has a width and height, but no explicit padding or margin. We can also just kind of grab out whatever element we want here if we click on it. And this time, we can see that there is some kind of other CSS being applied. Right, so the UL, the unordered list element, that has a bunch of list items as children, the UL itself has certain properties set. Right, notice there's a margin on the top and bottom. Let me scroll down a bit. Right, so there's a margin on the top and bottom. Nothing to do with border, but padding. There's no padding on the top, right, or bottom, but there's about 40 pixels padding on the left. Right, so it's kind of increasing the space inside this element so that it kind of spaces in these bullet points. Um, and then the content itself, 
is set explicitly here with a height and width property. Right, so that, that's pretty neat, right? We can kind of get some glimpse of what the box model looks like. And, you know, again, if you're not quite getting it, I think once we start to write some CSS of our own, it's probably going to make a little bit more sense. But just did want to bring your attention to the fact that, you know, it is important to have an understanding of this box model, um, especially when it comes to setting things like padding and margin and understanding why your document looks the way it does um, when it comes to, you know, styling the CSS. Now, with our understanding of the box model and with some knowledge of what CSS rules look like, let's go ahead and let's start writing some CSS to style up our recipe page here. So this page that I have prepared, ready to go. Um, so we're going to take a look at how to grab out a certain element in the HTML and also how to apply styles to it. Uh, so there's a couple ways that this can be achieved. The way that I'm going to show you now will be to, in JSPIN anyway, you just go to the CSS tab. And this is the way you would do it if you do want to have your CSS in a separate file, uh, which generally is the more common way of doing it. We can take a look at a different way later on, but essentially it would just consist of putting our CSS inside of a style element um, in the head of your HTML. But in any case, if we are doing it this method, we will basically have a separate CSS file. JSBin takes care of kind of hooking it up to our HTML document, so we don't need to worry about that. Again, because JSBin is kind of a nice uh, resource to, to start learning on. So what I want to do is I, first of all, just want to use kind of a very general selector. And we'll take a look at the couple of different selector types um, and why you might want to use one over the other. But the first thing I want to do is just kind of a general broad style across the entire page. And I want to do something like set a background color for the entire thing. Right now it just ha kind of has the default white background color. And what we can do is we can figure out how to grab this body element because if you recall from the HTML section, body basically wraps everything on the page inside an opening body tag and a closing body tag which means if we set the background for the entire body, it should also have an effect on the rest of these, these pieces that are, you know, you can kind of consider them children of the body element. So these are all contained within the body element. So all we need to do, and we can just use a kind of general selector to grab this element. Um, in this particular case, there's only one body element on the page, so that kind of simplifies things a little bit. So we can just grab body, like so. Um, and then we have our opening and closing brackets, right? This is kind of our block that's going to execute. And essentially, this is where you set up your style. And I happen to know off the top of my head how to set the background color property, like so, background hyphen color. And that's kind of the format that CSS takes, right? It's property. Uh, if it has, if it's kind of a compound word or two words, you usually have a hyphen in the middle. And with CSS, you know, they, they do use Americanized spelling. That's why color has no U on it. If you're coming from a non-US uh, English speaking country, um, it does use US standardized uh, language essentially. So in any case, background color, and then you can just type in whatever color you want it to be. So if you wanna see something, it's gonna be kind of hard on the eyes. We can just type in red here, for example. And here we see JSPIN just kind of auto updates on the fly for us, which is convenient when you're developing um, I also do have it out in my separate tab here, so I can just refresh this page and we can see that we are successful, right? So we successfully loaded up some CSS, we grabbed the body and we set the background color. Um, now there's a couple different ways you can set the color, right? Remember that you can do an RGB value, you can do a hex value, um, and there's a bunch of other neat built-in colors as well. For example, forest green is one such color. Um, so again, it's, it's just about kind of Googling, seeing what your resources are out there in terms of what names are available in uh, CSS. So forest green is still a bit too green for my taste. Let's kind of tinker around a little bit. We can try something like light blue. Okay, I think that looks pretty okay at first glance. Um, I think that'll do for now anyway. Um, so cool, we just styled our first element using CSS. Now, remember when I mentioned that there's only one body element on the page, so this makes doing something like this easier. And what does that mean exactly? What did I mean by that? You know what, I'm just going to get rid of this output over here, just so it's more clear what we're doing. Um, 
what I mean by that is, well, let's let's take another quick peek at our HTML here. So we have this header tag. Right? We have a main, we have section, blah, blah, blah. So let's consider something like section. So we have one section element here, right, which wraps these things. And then in here, we also have a section element. Not just one, but two or three. Right? These sections are all over the place. So we have a whole bunch of section elements on our page. So what do you think would happen if we try to target section with our CSS here? So we target these section selectors and we apply some kind of styling on it. Right, so let's see. Let's find out. So grab section. And again, probably quickest way to see some result is to set the background color. So let's try setting the background color. Background color, something we can really see. We'll do orange. Okay, so let's refresh over here and let's see what happens. Boom, refresh. Okay, and isn't that interesting? Right, so we can see it applied orange to a whole bunch of elements. Um, now, why did it do that? Well, it basically understood us grabbing every single element that is section, which is essentially most of the content on our page. Right? So pretty much everything is wrapped inside of a section. And that's something we really need to understand about CSS is that these kind of generalized selectors, they could be selecting multiple things at once. In the first instance, we only have one body element. That's why we don't need to worry about any kind of side effects. But for our section, well, maybe we didn't want to color every single section orange. Maybe we only wanted to color certain sections orange. Um, we're going to investigate different ways that we could have approached that. But this is really just to show you that you are able to kind of grab multiple things at once, especially with these kind of very broad selectors. So this just goes in and grabs every single HTML element that is a section. Right, so I will get rid of that example because I don't actually want all my sections to be orange. Uh, but that could be useful, as you can imagine, if you want to set kind of a consistent style across your, uh, your web page. So let's say, for example, you always want your paragraphs to have a certain font size. So you don't really like the default font size for these paragraphs. You want to change that with CSS. It's a pretty common scenario that you might run across. So how can you do that? Well, we kind of know already how to grab every single paragraph on this page. Right? So every paragraph we have wrapped in P tags, which means you can just use a selector like so. So we grab all the P tags on the page and we can apply some styling. Font size, let's try, oh, I don't know, just off the top of my head, 50 pixels, like so. Right, so notice the hyphen. Let's refresh. Okay, so our paragraphs have now become quite a lot bigger, um, but it doesn't affect things like this. So what is that? What is that ingredients thing? Well, we can see that it's a UL. Right, so it's an unordered list with list items. Um, inside of it. Now that's not wrapped in a paragraph tag. So our CSS does not apply here or here, but it does apply here. And essentially, as you can see, it applies only to things that are wrapped in P tags, right? So it doesn't affect this H1, doesn't affect this, which I think is an H3. Uh, oh, it's an H4. Actually, no, this one, U2. Yeah, that's an H3, right? So Again, very easy to style up large parts of your app at once with CSS, as long as you know what your selectors are doing. Let's tinker a little bit more with our CSS rule here for our paragraph tags. So I'm going to decrease the font size by a bit because I don't like the, them being quite so big. And let's see if we can kind of get a deeper understanding of the box model. Right? Recall this, uh, this representation of the box model. So if we want to take a quick look, again, just as a reminder, we can right click on one of these paragraphs, inspect, and we can kind of see some details, right? So they have a 30 pixel margin on the top and bottom. We can see that here, um, but no border, no padding, nothing going on there. So what if we were to add padding? Another thing I want to do is, this is something I do all the time, is if I'm working on a particular piece in terms of CSS, um, I give it a specific background color that's different than the rest of the page, just so that you can kind of easily pull out what section you are explicitly working on. So I'll color it teal for now, and we can come back in and, and change it later. 
So let's see what happens if we do kind of start to play around with some of these uh, box model related properties. For example, let's say we want to add some padding on the top of all of our paragraphs. Let's try adding a 50 pixel padding on top and let's see what happens. Okay, I'll refresh this. Notice that the background is still teal, except now we have all this padding on top. Right? And that makes sense when you consider the fact that padding gets sort of considerate part of the content a little bit. Right? Because it's kind of adding padding between the border, which would be somewhere around here, and our content. Right? This is all pure padding here. And if we again inspect it now that we've updated it, we can kind of scroll down, we can see that our padding has been set. Right, so you can see it highlighted here. It's been set. You can tell in your Chrome Dev Tools, um, and you can of course set the other padding sides as well. So padding left, 25 pixels. Padding right, 50 pixels. Padding bottom. Let's do 30 pixels. Going to be looking pretty weird. All right, so it's spaced out a little weird, but we see we have padding here and there and on the bottom. Now let's see if we can figure out the difference between padding and margin. All right, so again, if we inspect, what's our margin look like? Well, we don't have any margins on the side. Um, it does appear to have some margin, just because body, the body element itself, does have some built-in um, margin on it, and that's just a web browser thing. Don't really need to worry about it. But if you're wondering why there's a bit of space here, it's because there's some default styling applied to the entire body. Now, in any case, we can see that there's no margin on these paragraphs by default. But what if we want to add one? We want to make sure that there's a kind of a nice margin in there. Well, that's simple enough as well. We can do margin left. Let's do 20 pixels on the left. Let's see what that looks like. Refresh. Right. So notice that it didn't affect the background color, and it just kind of added some margin here. Right? Recall that margin is kind of the space outside of the content and padding. So this is how you can kind of separate your content from other content. And it would make sense if we want to have a bigger margin on the top and bottom of these elements. Well, we can just do something like margin bottom, 20 pixels, margin top, 20 pixels. And these are just arbitrary numbers I'm using right now, by the way. Um, but it looks like it actually sort of reduced the default margin. Right, so what if we increased it? Let's say 50 and 50. Refresh. Right, so now there's a big margin here and here and here and on the bottom of this paragraph. Right, again, we can inspect it. And we'll scroll down. And we can kind of highlight. OK, so look at all this margin on the top, 50 on the top, 50 on the bottom. Right, it kind of starts to make sense. And you can really use this kind of same logic to grab any element you need. Um, so you know what, I will get rid of this padding and margin stuff. I'll leave the color as teal on the paragraphs for now. But one thing you could do if you really wanted to is, you know, let's say you're not satisfied with the size of this H1. Um, and, you know, normally I would recommend leaving H1 the same size, but if you did want to increase the size, you know, maybe this H1 is just not big enough, you want something even more bigger and bolder, for example, well, let's go ahead and let's grab the H1. And again, I think we only have H1 once on our web page. So we don't have to worry about side effects. So we'll just grab the H1 and we can increase the font size. Let's try, let's see, we'll try 20 pixels and see what that looks like. Refresh. Okay, so that actually made it smaller. That had the opposite effect of what I wanted. So let's try sizing it up. 50 pixels, that looks a little bit bigger. Let's try 60 pixels. Refresh. Okay, cool. Um, now let's see, since we're working on this one, we'll add a background color here as well. I'll just do teal because it's pretty easy on the eyes. Right, so we can see it takes up the entire width here, um, minus this kind of default body margin. So what if you wanted to center this text? Uh, what's the property to do that? Well, that one, it's just text align. Let me see. Center should do the trick. This is how we want the text inside the H1 to be aligned. So we refresh, and hey, there we go. We see that it's now aligned. Cool, so that works pretty well. Um, and it looks nice because 
it just kind of, you know, the browser just by default extended it to be the entire width of its containing element. And the containing element of this h1, it's the main, um, which has as a parent the body. So, you know, if all this was indented one space, that might make it a bit more clear. Right, so all of these things are children of body. So we have this as a child, this is a child. So really you consider the H1 as sort of a grandchild of the body. Um, but because we don't have like explicit width set anywhere, that's why I just kind of expanded out to fill the width here. Now that would change if we did set a width on the H1, for example. So let's see what happens if we explicitly set a width. And let's do a width of just 200 pixels. And let's see what that looks like. Right, so now it's not nearly as wide. Um, that's a bit too small, though. So I'm going to widen it a little bit. Let's try 500. Right, And now the text itself, it's still centered, but it's centered inside of the H1. And the H1 only has so much width that it can use. Um, so this is something that you'll probably spend a lot of time tinkering around with when you're learning CSS. And you know what? Even experienced developers do tend to tinker around a lot with their CSS to get it to look how they want it to look. Um, and you know, just to, just to try a different example, let's try 1,000 pixels in terms of width. Right. So it still does not appear to be centered on the page. Uh, the text itself is centered. It's just that the container, it's only this amount of width. Right, so that's something to consider. Um, and you know what? I'll remove this and let's see what happens now. Now, what happens if I were to grab the parent of this H1? And that, that really is uh, that's a really good way to think about these elements is that they have parents and grandparents. And these elements have children and grandchildren, for example. And what I'm getting at, basically, is if we set an explicit width on our main element, that will affect all of the children elements of main. So let's see what I mean by that. So I'm going to set a width here on main of 1000 pixels. And we'll see how it affects the rest of these pieces. So let's refresh. Right? And now all of our content, you notice that it has the exact same width, except this footer, which is actually outside of main. Right? We close main, and then we have a footer. Um, and the header at the very top is also not included in main. But in any case, we can see that the effects kind of ripple down, right? So we have an explicit width now set on main. And main has a whole bunch of children. And that's really a key concept to understanding CSS. Think about the name. It's cascading style sheets. So whenever you set a property on some kind of general selector like main that has a whole bunch of children, it gonna, it's going to cascade down through all the children. Um, so this could have serious effects, right? So your width, um, usually you don't really set an explicit width on main like this, but you could if you wanted to. Um, and then you could have a separate element kind of sitting over on the side, perhaps. Um, you could also do something like, OK, I'll, I want all of my uh, fonts to have this color in my main, color white, for example. And this color property is how you set font color. So if I refresh, right again, it, I didn't have to go in and manually select all of these elements because they're all children of main. The only ones that weren't affected are those that are not contained inside the main element. Right, so pretty important concept, uh, pretty key concept when it comes to CSS is kind of understanding what it means when something cascades down. A big part of understanding CSS is under, understanding the cascade. So what does it mean to be a cascading style sheet? And what I mean by that is, let's say, OK, so we set our color for all of our text as white. But we want our paragraphs here, for example, to be a different color. How can we do that? And really, it's just a matter of declaring specifically on these paragraph elements that you want it to be a different color other than what was set on a parent or grandparent element. Now, most properties. Um, are inherited. And you know what? I'm just going to move this P down below main here so that the example is a bit more clear. Right, so in any case, we're, we're grabbing main. And then we have paragraphs inside of that as well as elsewhere. But I wanted to put this below here. And let's say we want our paragraph to be a different color other than white. 
And kind of the, the default for a lot of these elements is that it just inherits the color from its parent. So if we kind of trace that up here, let's take a look. Um, so we have, let's take this one for example. We have this paragraph and it's we set it to inherit from section. Now section itself inherits from article and article itself inherits from main because it's the child of main. So this is kind of the default kind of happens behind the scenes for a lot of these elements. But all you need to do is just kind of declare a different value if you want a different value to apply for any particular element or set of elements. And that involves understanding how these properties kind of cascade through. So you don't need to know too, too much. You just need to know that, you know, if you do need a different style on any particular piece, you have to know where it is and how to grab it. For example, if we wanted the color of our paragraphs to be uh, orange instead of white. We just need to declare that and then it applies it to our paragraphs here. Right, so it applies it to these ones and also paragraphs everywhere just because we use the general paragraph selector. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's good to know that you can do that with CSS. Right, and just to show that off one more time, remember when I said that P is a child of section? Well, let's grab section here and let's set the color to uh, orange here. And then in here, I'll just get rid of this declaration and let's see what happens. All right, so we'll refresh, okay? And it doesn't look like anything changed except now this is orange and these are all orange because these are all children of section. All right, and again, it just kind of does behind the scenes that default, it inherits the color from a parent or grandparent and again, you just need to declare it separately if you don't want the parent element style to be applied. Right, so now this is brown, this is orange, and so on and so forth. So everything kind of cascades down. Really need to have a good understanding of parent, child, grandchild, etc. Okay, I do not actually want brown color though, so I'll undo that. And just as another example, so we set width on main. And we can see that it just applied everywhere here. And it's kind of a similar situation, right? So we have sections here. Let's say we wanted our sections to all be a different width than main for some reason, right? And so you could basically do something like width. Let's say our sections, we wanted them to be wider, 1400 pixels instead of 1000. What would that look like, right? So now we have to scroll, but we can see that it works. So we're, we're not uh, limited in terms of what the parent is set at. Uh, as long as you know how to change it, right? Because default, it was, again, behind the scenes, just inheriting the width from its parent element. Let's try 1,200 pixels. Yeah, there we go. Right? We can see it didn't apply it to this because this H1, it's not contained inside a section element. So you can do that, and then again, you could come into your paragraph and set an even different width. So this one you could make really small, like 500 pixels if you wanted to. And you can see that happens there. Okay, so let me undo that and this, but it definitely is possible. So we know how to use these kind of general selectors to grab, you know, large swaths of our CSS wherever we need to. What if we wanted to get more specific? So let's say, for example, we have this UL in here. Right, that's kind of our nav list at the very top and we want to apply some styling to that UL. But we don't want to apply it to every single UL on the page, right? We also have a couple other ULs. We have, well, we have one here, and then we have an OL here, right? So we have one other UL on the page. So how could we make sure that we're selecting only this particular UL? Right? Because if I just go and try to grab every UL and make background color orange, for example, well, we can try that out. We'll wait for this to refresh here. And here we go. We see that now this UL is orange, but also this one is. Right, so how can we be more specific? Well, there's a couple ways. And one of the ways we can do it is if we have an understanding of this kind of parent-child relationship. So you know what I'm going to do is I will get rid of some of the CSS that I've already written. We'll come back in and change it later to make it actually look a little bit nicer. Uh, so just to kind of do a reset here. We'll keep the background color just so that we have that kind of uh, nice little change to look at. And oh, looks like it didn't quite catch all the changes. You know, what, I'm just going to pop it out uh, this way, just to be sure. Pop it out again. 
Um, okay, so we have set the background color. Now let's say we did want to do some kind of change to our nav list. Right, so it's in our header. And what we can do with CSS is you can basically kind of drill down through this kind of parent-child relationship if you just kind of do something like this. So you know you can do header um, and then you can just immediately after that put the element you want to select that's a child or a grandchild or some descendant of this header element. Right, so in this case the style that I apply here will only apply to ULs that have parent, a parent or grandparent um, or you know upper grandparent or whatever uh, as header. Right, so for example, the background color orange again here, just to be able to see it. Refresh. Okay, that'll take a second, and then we will see that this UL up here is orange, while the one down here will be unaffected. Okay, looks like it's a little slow today, so let's just check it out in the output over here. Um, header UL, yeah, it should be working. Just let that load up again. Um, in any case, as you can see, um, having a good understanding of this kind of parent, grandparent, child, grandchild relationship is pretty important to have, right? And there, finally, we see that it is orange. The one down here is not orange. Um, and this can be pretty useful, right? So the UL doesn't have to be a direct descendant of header. We could have something like a div, right? Recall from our HTML tutorial that div is just a way of kind of splitting up the page and it acts the same as like a header or a main tag. You can see, even though there's kind of a div in between the UL and the header, UL is still technically a descendant of header. So we are still just kind of making sure that we have header as an ancestor somewhere. And if we refresh, we'll see that it's still orange. Um, and it's, again, it's just a little bit slow right now. Right, and just as a sanity check, let's do some other color just to make sure that it is still working as intended. Um, always kind of a good idea to, to do testing as you're going along with this kind of stuff. Um, but this can be useful, right, if you only want to target specific pieces using these kind of generalized selectors again. Right, so again, it's still not quite updated. We'll just wait for that here. Um, but in any case, you can see how that's, that's good to know, right? We could have done the same for main um, and just grab main section. Uh, so let's do that, actually. Right, and there we see that it did update. Right, so if we wanted to try that out, we could do something like, okay, I'm going to grab main, and I only want to select the sections that are uh, part of main. Right, so you can do main section. You could do something like font size. Let's make them all pretty tiny, 10 pixels, see what that looks like. And we'll just wait here. Okay, looks like it didn't quite catch, or maybe it did. It's kind of hard to tell sometimes. Um, but in any case, you can see that it's grabbing main. We're grabbing each section, right? So we're still grabbing multiple things in this instance, but the sections have to be a descendant of main, right? And there we go, that it did take effect, right? So all our text is really tiny now, but only for the sections that are children or descendants of main. And you could get even more specific too. So this can kind of go a long way down. So you can say, Okay, I want to grab main section and only sections that are inside of another section. Or maybe a simpler example would be, I want to grab only the article. Right, so only article that is a descendant of main, like so. Main article. Again, we can see here why indentation is important because I can just immediately tell from the way that it's indented, that article, it's indented kind of one space over from main. So I can tell that it's a child of main. So you can grab main article, and then you can grab the sections in that way. right? So you can do that, or you could do something like main article h4. Right? If you have a lot of h4s on your page, but you only want to grab the ones that are part of the article section in your main, you could do that. Right? We can see what happens if I refresh. Uh, hopefully it catches the changes right off the bat. But you can basically always kind of drill down if you are using these kind of general selectors to wherever you need to go to. Right, so let's see, H4 would be these, I believe. That one and this one looks correct to me. And you know, this often involves a lot of tinkering to get it correct as well, right? Technically we only have one H4 anywhere on our page, but we could have also just done main H4. 
Again, because h4 is a descendant of main. So somewhere in its ancestry, it has a main element. If I refresh here, if we wait for it, you'll see that it, it will be the same. So maybe a more practical use case here would be, well, we have a couple images on our page, right? So this one, which is kind of a big image at the top, uh, this is outside of our article, but inside of our main element. And then we have another image somewhere here. So this one is inside article, right? So we could do something like, okay, give me the main section, give me article, and I want to manipulate only the images that are inside the article somewhere. And with images in CSS, you can definitely resize them. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, you could do something like width, and you can just set it as, for example, we'll do, I don't know, 100 pixels. And you can also just let it take care of scaling for you. So height auto. Uh, this should preserve the aspect ratio so your image doesn't get all weird and stretched out. So if you're setting one, generally you want to set the other. And what I mean by that is if you're setting height explicitly, you generally want to set width to be auto and vice versa, just so that you do preserve the aspect ratio. But let's test this out. Let's see if we are able to kind of make the width pretty small, 100 pixels. So we'll refresh. Hopefully our CSS will kick in right away and we won't have to refresh again. And there we see that it did work while well, this image up here is unaffected, right? So again, it's all about kind of understanding the ancestor and descendant relationship. Because if we had just grabbed image, this would grab every single image tag on our page. Pages, you generally have a whole bunch of images if it's, of course, an image heavy site. Uh, so you, you usually want to be more specific, right? Because here, whoops, I accidentally styled this one when I meant to only style that image. Right. And you know, let's tinker around with this a little bit to make it look a little bit wider so we can actually see it a bit more. Um, but I think you get the idea at this point, right? So it's, it's all about kind of understanding where in the hierarchy your elements are and manipulating them with your CSS. When it comes to these general broad selectors that just kind of grab out HTML elements, um, sometimes you do want to be a bit more specific. And that's definitely possible. We just have to kind of understand the terminology. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create kind of a testing area up here to demonstrate this concept. I'm not going to tinker with the actual HTML that we've written previously. So what this section is going to be, it's going to be a section. And inside the section, we'll have a div, just kind of a generic div to split up this section. Inside the div, we'll have an h4. So that's a header size 4, which is kind of a small header. Um, pretty small text here, and this will say I'm in the outermost div. And then we are also going to nest inside this div an inner div, so it's going to have a nested div inside of it. Um, and this as well will have an h4, and this will say I'm in the innermost div slash h4. Right, and if we take a quick peek, refresh over here, um, we should be able to see it right off the bat. Right, so there's our outermost div and there's our innermost div. So we know if we wanted to just grab this entire div covering all the stuff inside of it, we can easily just grab section div and we can set the color to red. That should work as intended. Right, we'll let this refresh and then we'll take a look. Yep, there we go. We could even do section h4. Right, so grab every h4 that is descended from section somewhere. Right, that should work just fine. Uh, once that refreshes, we'll be able to see that. Right, so there we see it has been applied. But let's say we only wanted to color this H4 red, and we wanted to leave this one alone. How could we do that? Well, we can do that if we understand how to be a little bit more specific in our uh, search, essentially. And we can use this greater than symbol. And what this greater than symbol does, it basically grabs only the direct children elements. So when I do direct child div, well, this doesn't make a huge difference. This is still going to color them all red because basically I'm saying, okay, section, for every direct div child you have, I'm going to apply this style to your insides, basically. Right, so if I refresh, and just as a sanity check, we'll do a different color to make sure that it catches. Um, so this, it won't have any effect except for changing the color. And let's refresh again so it does actually catch. Right, so there we see it doesn't really have any immediate change. But if we keep going with this, we can kind of alter our query here a little bit to target specifically the H4 
that is a direct descendant of this sort of outer div. So essentially what we're saying is we're being explicit. So we're saying, okay, I want to grab all the section elements on the page, and then I want to access the direct and only the direct descendants, which are divs. Right? And then from that, I only want to access the h4s that are direct descended from that particular div, which would include this one, but would not include this one. Right, so let's refresh, and I'll change the color again here. Let's do yellow so it really stands out. And let's see if we were successful. OK, so it's still orange for some reason, but we'll try it again until it goes yellow. And there we see that this H4 is yellow. This one is unstyled in terms of the color, right? because we were really specific with our CSS rule here. Right, so again, we're saying section grab only this div that's a direct descendant, so we're not technically grabbing this. And then we're grabbing the h4 that is the direct descendant of that div. So how could this be useful? Well, in our case, let's say we have another such construct. Right, so I'll just copy this and make another div right there. And let me indent it correctly. Right, so this should be over and this and this and this and this. Uh, yeah, so that looks OK, I think. Yeah. Right, so we have, let me separate these out, actually. So we have a couple divs now. So one div and then another. And we'll say this h4 can say, I'm in the second div. I'm in the innermost second div. OK, and let's see what happens when I refresh. OK, we'll just wait for that to load. And there we see that, oh, isn't that weird? Right, so what are we doing? Again, we're doing the same thing. It's just grabbing the first direct child. Right, so this is a direct child of section, as is this one. And we're grabbing the direct h4 child within that div. And again, it, it pays to have a good understanding of this ancestor descendant relationship. We're grabbing the direct descendant only in either of these cases. That's why it's being applied here and also here. Now, we don't have to do it this way. If we just wanted to apply the yellow to all the h4s that are descended from divs, well, we just need to get rid of this. Right? And this is essentially us saying, OK, grab the divs that are direct descended from section. And inside of those divs, for every h4 you find, turn it yellow. So if we refresh, we'll see that they're all yellow. And that's going to be similar to the query we did um, right at the beginning of, of, uh, of this section. Right, but you can probably see how this would be useful if you have you know, related content on your site laid out in sort of a logical way, and you want to apply certain stylings to certain pieces. And you could take it even further, too. So you could say, OK, give me the direct descendant div, and then inside that div, give me that div's direct descendant. Right, so we're kind of drilling down. And then we can say, OK, so for this one, make the color yellow. And let's see what happens now. So we will refresh. Let's observe. Right, so isn't that interesting? Right, because we're kind of drilling down even further. So we go section, grab this div, and then grab this div, and apply styling to the insides of that div. Right, so that means if we had another element here, I'm a paragraph slash p. We'll do one in here as well. I'm also a paragraph slash p. If we refresh, we'll see that it's all yellow because it's all contained within this inner div. And this one didn't quite get there yet. Uh, but if we, again, wanted to target only particular pieces, we could do that like so, direct grabbing the h4, or we could just grab only the h4s that are inside this div. There's all kinds of different ways that we can achieve what we want. But it definitely pays to have a good understanding of, again, this kind of ancestor descendant relationship because you should be able to parse out what the CSS is doing and kind of understand what the selector thingy is, right? What is it doing? Why is that there? Why is that different from what we're doing up there, for example? <laughs>